see you all. Um, so today's webinar is going to be on uh, costs in financial remedy proceedings. Uh, so just a, a little introduction about ourselves. Uh, George has introduced introduce herself. Uh, and then, um, so I'm Hannah and I'm also on the Park Lane Plowden uh, finance team as well. Uh, so starting uh, with uh, the seminar, I'm going to be covering uh, the summary of cost principles uh, in financial remedy proceedings first. Um, so we've got some slides to join this. Um, um, I will be sharing my screen and uh, I'll be keeping an eye on the on the chat. Uh, the format of this webinar means that I can't actually see you, but I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. And just so that you know, the seminar is going to be recorded uh, for you to be able to watch again in the future if you wish to. Uh, we are going to keep it um, short and, and sweet um, and we hope to finish by about half past five to avoid taking up too much of your evening. Um, you should have received a handout that Hannah and I have prepared that goes into far more detail about the principles of cost and offers um, than we hope to cover. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, get in touch with us or with our clerks and they will, um, they will help you. So I'll start my screen share just now. Uh, so, uh, if you want to also have your handouts at the same time to have access to those, and I'm just going to run uh, through the handout um, with the slides alongside. Uh, so, dealing with costs in family proceedings first. Um, so, part 28 of the family procedure rules sets out the, uh, the general cost regime that you'll come across in family cases. Uh, this is where you'll need to look and this will be your starting point. Uh, so, the starting point is always that uh, the court may at any time make such an order as to cost as it thinks just. Uh, so, the court always retains a discretion uh, as to whether it will allow costs at a hearing. Uh, this rule is found in uh, 28.1 of the family procedure rules. Um, rule 28.2 then disapplies uh, what you might uh, be used to as the general civil rule uh, that the unsuccessful party will be ordered to pay the costs of the successful party. Um, the position in family law uh, and in the family court is that uh, there are two general regimes that apply to costs. Um, there are some exceptions where the, um, the CPR will apply, uh, but we'll come to those later. Um, but the general rule is that um, it's either the, what's known as the clean sheet regime, uh, and this is the general regime that you'll find un under the family procedure rules. And then there's the no order regime. Uh, and this one is specific to the financial remedy uh, regime, uh, which is set out in uh, rule 28.3. Uh, so dealing with that one first. So the financial remedy proceedings have their own distinct procedure in costs. Uh, and that's set out specifically in 28.3527. Uh, and, and they provide for the following. Uh, so the general rule in financial remedy proceedings um, is that the court will make uh, will not make an order uh, requiring one party to pay the costs of the other. So that's the, the no order principle. That's the starting point in uh, financial remedy proceedings. However, there are um, exceptions where the court can depart from that general rule. So the court may make an order for costs uh, at any stage in the proceedings where it considers it appropriate to do so uh, on the basis of conduct. Um, and the rule set out uh, specifically at 28.37, um, the conduct that the court must have regard to when considering whether to make such costs uh, under this rule. So where the court considers it appropriate, it must have regard to uh, any failure by a party to comply with the rules or any order of the court or practice direction that the court thinks relevant uh, in the hearing. Um, any open offer that's been made to settle, uh, whether it was reasonable for a party to raise or pursue um, a particular allegation or an issue that's arisen uh, within the proceedings. 
the manner to which the party uh, that we're looking at has pursued uh, their application or a particular allegation or issue in the proceedings, uh, any other aspect of a party's conduct um, and the general financial effect of the parties um, of any costs order. Uh, so, the, as I've set out, the court can depart from this general no order principle uh, and therefore make a cost order where it thinks uh, it's appropriate to do so on a party's conduct. Um, and as Georgia will note later on in the uh, webinar, uh, practice de direction um, uh, 23A uh, paragraph 4.4 provides that uh, conduct can encompass uh, the failure of a party to negotiate uh, openly and reasonably uh, as part of this overall wider conduct aspect. Um, the costs rule set out then at uh, FPR 28.3.5 to 7. Um, they only apply to the main financial remedy hearings. Um, so this is things such as the first appointment, uh, the FDR and the final hearing. So it's those main core hearings that you would have in any normal financial remedy proceedings uh, that the specific rules apply to. So Anything that is a interim application or an interim hearing, uh, which is made or heard as separate from the main proceedings, um, that will follow what's known as the clean sheet regime. Um, and effectively, what this means is that um, the financial um, apologies, uh, basically, what the court has done is drawn a distinction between. Um, applications and hearings that are in connection with a financial order uh, and therefore treated as an interim hearing uh, and those that are specifically for the financial order. Um, and this distinction was drawn in the case of judge and judge. Um, this was further um, confirmed in the case of Baker and Rowe in 2009. Uh, 2009. Uh, but effectively what the court is um, what the rules say is that if it's if it's an interim hearing, uh, we go with the clean, clean sheet regime. Um, so it might be that there's a particular application for something such as uh, jurisdiction uh, that may, might arise uh, within the proceedings or as set out in uh, rules 28. Point three, uh, four bi and nine. Um, this sets out a list of um, interim applications and hearings uh, to which the rules do not apply to. Um, now dealing with the clean sheet regime and the principle and what this effectively means. Um, the clean sheet uh, effectively means that there is no presumption either way. Uh, so neither the general rule in the financial remedy proceedings uh, nor the general rule in civil proceedings apply. So the court effectively starts with a clean sheet, no presumption either way, uh, and the court starts from that basis. Um, however, um, the case of Baker and Rowe uh, did identify that um, even where the judge does start with what's known as this clean sheet, uh, the fact that one party has been unsuccessful um, will be given greater weight um, and properly count as a decisive factor in the exercise of the judge's discretion when ordering costs. Um, this has also been seen in uh, KS and ND uh, and also uh, Djokovic and Djokovic number two, um, where effectively it says that um, prima facie, the costs will follow the event and that they should um, apply to matters that aren't covered by the specific financial remedy regime. Um, the court, however, um, did hold in that case that um, this principle would not apply in Schedule 1 proceedings. Uh, so you just start with the clean sheet regime uh, in those cases. Um, now, I did mention earlier that there are some further exceptions to the general rules. Um, so these are set out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in your handout, and uh, that, which states that the proceedings under the Inheritance Act 1975 and also TILATA will remain governed by the CPR um, rules. Um, 
Turning to the assessment of costs, um, under the uh, Family Procedure Rules, Rule 28.2, um, the CPR provisions that are contained uh, in 44.3, 44.4 and 44.6 are also uh, adopted into this uh, financial regime. Uh, which basically means that where the court does decide to make a costs order, uh, it can make a summary assessment at the hearing itself um, or order a detailed assessment by a costs officer or a judge. Uh, so everything we know simply from the CPR. Um, now, a summary assessment will normally be um, conducted where the hearing itself uh, lasts no more than a day, um, unless uh, the court thinks that there is good reason not to do so. Uh, now, the practice direction uh, provides the following example as to where there might not be, um, where there may be a good reason. Uh, for example, where the paying party uh, shows substantial grounds for disputing the sum claimed and that it can't be dealt with summarily. Um, the court then can make an assessment on the standard or indemnity basis, uh, and this is set out at CPR Rule 44.3. Um, so where the costs are assessed on the standard basis, um, the court will normally allow uh, costs which are reasonably and proportionately incurred and proportionate and reasonable in amount. And there's this extra provision that um, the court will resolve any doubt as to this in favour of the paying party. Uh, now, the indemnity basis is slightly uh, stricter than that, um, and it imposes a more harsh outcome on the pay, uh, paying party. Um, it doesn't impose a proportionality requirement uh, as the standard basis does. Uh, so 44.3 subsection three provides that when assessed on the indemnity basis, uh, the court um, will only give consideration to those costs that were reasonably incurred or were reasonably in, uh, reasonable in amount. And that will be made in favor of the receiving party. Um, Key cases in identifying uh, when a matter may be an indemnity case or a um, standard, some um, apologies, uh, or a standard case um, are set out in the cases of Dixon and Radley House Partnership and others, and also the Three Rivers District Council case. Uh, now, these are really key cases uh, that you will need to know uh, when presenting uh, an app. Um, an application for costs before the court um, and whether you're seeking it on the indemnity basis. Um, the general rule is that uh, for indemnity costs to be provided, um, there must be something that takes the situation or the case out of the norm. Uh, there needs to be a, a very significant level of unreasonableness or otherwise inappropriate conduct uh, on behalf of the party. Um, Dixon and Radley House describe it as a degree of badness of a point uh, may go into the scales on considering whether indemnity costs should be awarded. Um, so it's, it's quite a high test. Um, and again, Three Rivers sets this out uh, very neatly. And the, these are contained uh, in your handout. I'm not going to read through them, uh, but it's the degree of unreasonableness and something out of the norm that really uh, is required to be assessed uh, on the indemnity basis. Um, and then the factors generally to be taken into account by the court uh, in deciding the amount of the costs um, is then set out at CPR Rule 44.4. Um, again, I'm not going to take you through that, uh, but it generally follows the same rules um, as I've already set out. Um, and now I'll be turning to Georgia. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I hope that you can still hear us and see us okay. Um, so I will talk to you a little bit about um, the practical implications in, in, in your practice of uh, cost orders and how and, and when, when to pitch them on the basis of, of some of the provisions that are set out in the uh, family procedure rules and also in, in case law, which I, I personally find quite useful. Uh, so I'll be talking about um, failure to accept reasonable offers and grossly disproportionate costs. I would like to add that uh, there is a, a specific section in your handouts about wasted costs, uh, the principles of which are different to the ones that Hannah's just um, um, explained to you. I, I, 
I will not talk about those because it will take us uh, much longer than we expect. But certainly there is there is a section there uh, because we felt it appropriate to include the principles um, that the court will follow when when considering wasted costs. So turning to uh, failure to accept reasonable offers and the, its link to litigation conduct, uh, a very quick word about called bank offers. Uh, those of you who also have a civil practice will, will uh, be very familiar with, with those. Um, and uh, as you probably also know, there was a consultation aimed at solicitors and barristers and members of the legal profession in 2019 uh, as to whether those offers should be uh, reinstated. And uh, it's a consultation, the, um, the outcome of which was then published at some point in uh, 2020. And the majority of the, of the people that answered the consultation said that uh, it, they would be favorable uh, of, uh, to, to introduce the Calder Bank offers because it would uh, be a way of cutting down on delay and mitigation costs. But the concerns raised were in respect of uh, small, uh, smaller asset cases and needs cases and cases um, of domestic abuse, as well as the implications on litigants in person who, as you know, um, are, are very, very frequent, um, including in, in finance cases. And therefore, the um, Family Procedure Rules um, Committee on Costs decided that it requires further research um, on how lower asset cases might be impacted uh, by a reintroduction of Calder Bank. So the jury is out on that. Um, it could be said that they've kicked it in longer ass a little bit, but certainly it's something that will be looked into in due course and it's worth, it's worth having bearing that in mind. However, um, the court can still take into account um, the uh, litigants' failure to accept a reasonable open offer. And uh, that's uh, in really, that's linked to what Hannah's been talking about in terms of the court's discretion to order costs. And uh, it's also linked to the new provisions that have been modified and introduced in the family procedure rules uh, in terms of the uh, filing of uh, open offers and costs. Uh, you will be aware of uh, paragraph 4.4, practice direction 28A. I will not recite it in full, it's there and it's also in your packs, but the court will uh, take a broad view of conduct and uh, consider uh, that a ref refuse, refusing to negotiate reasonably and responsibly will amount to conduct uh, and the court will need to consider uh, making an order for costs. And quite importantly, it includes a needs case as well. Now, uh, I've quoted some uh, case law uh, that is uh, going to be, uh, I would suggest, of use to you, um, where uh, you, that you can quote certainly in correspondence and in your skeletons when you think that the other side are not uh, really taking the process very seriously of, of trying to negotiate. And uh, so I quote um, Mr. Justice Moore there in the case of SS and RS, um, that this is an obiter, so this was a failed appeal, but it's a comment that the judge, judges regularly take into account. And I've, I've heard it quoted at FDRs as well, uh, when the judge feels that, as you know, the judge cannot force you to reach an agreement. When, when the judge feels that the parties are not negotiating reasonably, then they will they will certainly give that um, notice and ask solicitors, barristers to advise their clients accordingly. Uh, so this is a very important case for you to take into account. Um, in terms of the recent changes, they are very important uh, because they they became in they came into effect uh, July last year, and they have uh, an impact on how you then uh, can draft the orders, especially after after an FDR. Um, so rule 9.27 has been amended um, as uh, as is set out in uh, in the screen and it deals with cost estimates uh, but um, that that is I won't read through that but it's what um, the rule says 
um, but very important uh, rule, the new rule 9.27a requires parties to file an open proposal for settlement within 21 days from the FDR if the court um, doesn't, if, if the parties don't settle or if there's no FDR 42 days before the final hearing. And uh, that's, I think, very, very important because if you feel that your client is making a reasonable proposal, uh, maybe coming down from the without prejudice proposal uh, at the FDR, uh, then you can certainly start to think about asking for costs uh, at the final hearing if you think that the other side are not negotiating reasonably as they should be doing. Um, now, this is... Um, a bit of a hot potato really because it happens sometimes that you um, not necessarily maybe in modest assets although it can happen but uh, what is the court's approach on a litigant who decides to um, use the top silk um, in the country for maybe a modest asset case and are, are we taking into account grossly disproportionate legal fees now in modest asset cases legal fees uh, outstanding legal fees are a liability and they're very they're very important because especially when you just if you distribute capital enabling the parties to rehouse, you have to consider whether one side or the other side still has 10 grand to pay in their legal fees. So usually um, the courts will be uh, quite sympathetic to that. However, um, where we are talking about grossly disproportionate legal fees, then the court is entitled to, um, to, to, ra to, to raise an eyebrow and say, well, I, I think that was out of order. Um, so the authority um, to for adjusting capital award in light of just grossly disproportionate costs is uh, RH and RH. Uh, but I would like to talk to you about uh, two other cases. So MF and SF, SF from 2015, and then the more recent WG against HG from 2018. Um, so in um, MF and SF, and SF, um, Mr. Justice Moyland um, ended up making an adjustment to the wife's award because he deemed her cost to be grossly disproportionate, but also, he, uh, and that links to what I was saying to you earlier, um, he determined that her case had been unsustainable from the outset and um, she should have accepted the husband's offer. And this case has been described as a rare example of both litigation conduct and uh, disparity in legal cost, which affected the quantum and the outcome in the proceedings. Um, WG, WG and HG, which is the more recent case, um, if you have time, you've got the reference there. Uh, if you have time, I would suggest you read through it because I find it quite amusing that uh, Mr. Justice Francis um, criticized the excessive litigation costs um, of the wife, but then ended up awarding her still 400,000 uh, pounds, which was um, just a little less than half of the total sum. So it's, he, he probably, he was critical, but uh, still awarded her quite, um, quite a lot of uh, money for her costs. Um, so that's the end of it. I'll stop sharing now and check the chat box if um, there are any questions. We've been able to stick to 30 minutes as promised and um, <laughs> I have seen a message from Dan saying thanks guys much slicker than my presentation it looks like I didn't need to put my suit on. Well Dan, um, yes that's right because I can't I can't see you but um, yeah, is um, I wonder whether there's anybody that wants to maybe share an experience with with us about a recent uh, cost order that they've been able to achieve. Um, I think when when we read these these um, cases of, of costs and judges hammering down on the on the on the husband or on the wife because they haven't accepted a a good offer, I always I always ask myself what what advice they've been given and, and sometimes 
there, there is a limit to the advice that you can give because your client just gives you a, a very clear instructions that they're not prepared to accept an offer. Um, but I would say always remind your clients, not just the other side, that there can be consequences for failing to litigate uh, reasonably and considering um, considering a good offer coming from the other side. So the consequences can be on them as well as um, on, on their opponent. So that's my little tip, um, which I'm sure is not new to you. But thank you all very much. I can see that a lot of people have joined us tonight. I know we're all very, very busy at the moment. So thank you for taking the time to, to see us this evening and, um, and to listen to us rumbling on about costs. And we do hope to be able to see you very soon in person.